Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, John from MSP. This is Ukraine War News Update, third part thereof for the 22nd of September 2024. We're going to start in this geopolitical video with the Taliban, the group uh, that I guess most of our democratic parties most aspire to. They're like the heroes of, of democracy and morality and freedom and autonomy free thinking all of the great aspects of humanity are i think wrapped up in the taliban the taliban just represent all that is good about life so it's no surprise then that they have sent a request to participate to, to participate in the brics summit in kazan so brics brazil russia india china south africa and all these other nerdwells and, and other countries that want to be a part of that I, I believe Zimbabwe have applied, Saudi Arabia. There's a whole host of nations who want to be a part of BRICS. And the Taliban. Uh, so that's great. Afghan terrorists in recent years have often come to Russia for economic forums and negotiations. For example, they're invited to the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum three years in a row. At the same time, the Taliban is still recognized as a terrorist organization in Russia, although in early June, the Russian Foreign Ministry and the Ministry of Justice proposed to remove it from that list. So... We have the tap. I mean, just look quite often. You say, you know, you can judge someone by who their friends are. You look at Russia and, and ask, well, who are your who are your mates? Oh, King John and oh, North Korea. That's nice. Who else? Oh, really? Iran. Mm, that's good. China. Oh, a little bit controversial there. And all oh, the Taliban. Oh, right. OK. Getting a sense of who you are. Just, yeah, there you go. Well, well done, Russia. You've come a long way. Right. And we have a Russian member of parliament, Milanov, saying uh, some pretty egregious stuff. Let's let let's talk through what he says here. So this is a Russian parliamentarian um, saying the following. Yes, it you if Darwin's theory is the only one and as true as Marx's capital, then what happens to LGBTs? He says, of course, that's a question we all want to answer. It turns out that they disprove and leave no stone unturned from this theory. Uh, at least I will agree with Darwin regarding Poles, Estonians and Latvians. Um, they are definitely descended from macaques, monkeys and earthworms. And we, Russians, Belarusians, and our allied friends are God's creatures, divine beings created by one God in his own likeness and greatness. I mean, I, as an atheist philosopher, I have somewhat given up on debating with creationists because you don't get too far and they just operate on a completely different rational basis and a, a fundamental knowledge base that is just not, not real knowledge. And and so when you start arguing these points, there's no point. It's the water off a duck's back. They just they operate to a completely different like rubric, and uh, and I've learned that over time. You just end up bashing your head against a, a a brick wall. Someone like this, just I mean, those short comments there are just full of obvious issue. Like here we have some humans humans that I don't like. They are descended from macaques and earthworms because that's how evolution works, isn't it? I like the, the tree of life. Yeah, it's not quite like that. We're not descended from macaques. Oh, I don't want to go over that tired old trope. Uh, difference between cousins and ancestors. Anyway, uh, and, and earthworms, throw earthworms in there. Now, to say that we humans... Those humans are descended from earthworms, but we humans, we are God's creatures, divine beings. Like, we're completely different. We're not descended from macaques and earthworms. Is not only to completely bastardise and mischaracterise the theory of evolution, but it's also to be... Oh, what's that word? Fascist. That was it. Yeah, fascist. Uh, just, it's like... These are subhuman. These are less than. And look at us. We are amazing. Belarusians and Russians. But Estonians, Poles and Latvians. Sucks to be you. You are nothing. And as nothing, we can exterminate you. That's where that kind of leads. And of course, we've seen that somewhere in history before. Not just once. Um, it just... 
yeah. And on the back of that, that kind of rhetoric and and the idea that the Taliban are the people to hang out in with the Russians, Hugo Boss have reopened a store in Moscow. So, hmm, reportedly, two stores of the German clothing and accessories manufacturer have reopened in Moscow's shopping centres. Earlier, it was reported that Hugo Boss stores in Russia, uh, that after their acquisition by retailer Stockman, will reopen in August to September. So, feel free to air your grievances to Hugo Boss on Twitter. Nothing like a bit of free speech, freedom of speech, uh, in Hugo Boss's way. Uh, okay, now... Russian government published a list of immoral countries, to be exact, quotes, impo those that impose destructive neoliberal ideological frameworks which contradict traditional Russian spiritual and moral values. Uh, really good company, by the way. Now, uh, this is interesting because that quote is itself just full of <sighs> issue. It's to say these people are immoral because they're neoliberal. Now, I might actually argue to some extent that I'm no big fan of neoliberalism. But it, but it, it's really interesting that they are rejecting neoliberalism, which is a kind of economic, um, economic desire for free market capitalism, uh, so on and so forth. The say take American conservative I I ideology as as it generally is. There's been this idea that Ayn Rand's objectivism, Ayn Rand's kind of um, uh, libertarian uh, espousal alongside the Chicago Boys economic models of free market, Milton Friedman and von Mises, you know, economic neoliberalism. That's what American conservatism has been all about for a good long time, right? Uh, you Paul Ryan holding up Atlas Shrugged in, in Congress those years ago, like, this is my Bible. Now, which is interesting because Ayn Rand was herself a, uh, was it a, <laughs> an illegal Russian immigrant who was an atheist and, uh, and advocated for abortion. But anyway, uh, as, as perfect human freedom, uh, not perfect, but as, as an example of, of hum, human autonomy. But anyway, it's just, this shows you how, how contorted the mental gymnastics has to be to espouse certain things but not others and cherry pick and, and whatever in in with so many politicians around the world anyway the idea so this jumbled mess of what i'm saying is the idea that the the russians here are vilifying neoliberalism was trying to uh, well, and holding on to russian spiritual and moral values should be fairly antithetical to what say american conservative neoliberals would espouse and most people who appear to be quite supportive of russia in certain political um areas on the u.s political landscape would would not agree with this so there's there's an interesting positioning going on here from the russians this is a weird thing for the russian government to do as well just list a a, a number of countries that you think are immoral just what a weird thing to do um and it just kind of goes to show where they are they're such a pariah nation that they're just f like flailing in a corner like an injured bear like ah uh, uh, we're, we're on the way down so uh, i'm just gonna list all the countries i think are immoral in the world like, who cares we're screwed anyway no one likes us anyway you suck you suck you suck it's like someone on like, at school when you like i can imagine uh, like an 11 year old school kid drawing uh, like writing uh, right jimmy come here should we write a list of all the kids we really hate jim yeah 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 oh yeah i yeah, hate them oh yeah a loser what a loser what about Slovakia? Do we hate Jimmy Slovakia? Uh, yeah, yeah. What about what about Bobby Hungary? Do we hate? No, 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 no. Actually, those two. No, we we're friends with them. They're really cool. Remember that the time when they uh, when they gave us their sweets when we demanded it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And lo and behold, <laughs> that's what's happened. Is Hungary and Slovakia the only <laughs> only NATO and EU members not to be included on Russia's list of evil, immoral Western countries? Make of that what you will. Gee whiz, Russia, is this where you're expecting to be? Like ten years ago, 
in 2013, you're like, oh, should we, should we invade, uh, should we invade Ukraine? Should we invade the Donbass with little green men? I reckon this would do us really well. Imagine where we're going to be in in 15 years' time. Just imagine it. Oh, should we do that? Yeah, let's do that. It's going to be great. Honestly, nothing could go wrong. 2024 comes along. Oh man, everyone hates us apart from the Taliban. Oh my goodness. Oh, that was a bad idea, wasn't it? I mean, it's going to be a long hangover. Right. The EU wants to strengthen control over the issuance of Schengen visas to citizens of Russia, according to European Commissioner Stella uh, Kyriakides. Now, to those who don't know, the Schengen area is the area where you've got free movement of people within within the EU and certain so nations who um, who are part of the Schengen Agreement. You can cross borders there and you don't kind of have to show passports and whatever. It's just open borders. And now there's this idea that Russia is going to get in through the back door through Hungary that's changed its visa um, situation whereby they are going to give uh, or going to allow lots of people from Russia this access to this to Hungary and therefore access through the back door to the Schengen area. So you get loads of Russians just milling around the Schengen area and the EU's pretty worried about this for obvious reasons. Uh, so at the plenary session of the European Parliament in Strasbourg, uh, she said that Russia is a threat to the European Union and the ease of entry into the EU for citizens of two hostile nations of countries raises questions. Absolutely 100%. Um, that is a challenge. Right, the largest Austrian bank leaves Belarus. And this is interesting because Raffaisen Bank has been, it was originally on like the blacklist, uh, the, the, the kind of naughty boys list of, banks and entities associated with Russia and Austria has been arguing that it should be taken off these lists because it's, it's a pretty important bank for them and yet it is facilitating Russia's ability to prosecute the war in in, in some tangible ways. There's been all this pressure on Austria and on Raffaisen Bank and then Austria used it as leverage to get things that they wanted Say, right, if you take Raffaison Bank off this list, we will allow X and Y to happen. And so it's been this political football, the bank. But it has, uh, so Raffaison Bank International has finalised a sale of 87.74% of its shares in a subsidiary prior bank uh, to Sovereign One, registered in the United Arab Emirates. So although they're offloading it, you do wonder whether they just have uh, got controlling interests all the way over in the UAE and the UAE are this country that appears to be so heavily involved in facilitating Russia being able to do X, Y and Z. Thus Southern One Holding Limited bought out the whole block of prior bank shares owned by Raffaisen Bank Group. This decision marks a final withdrawal of the Austrian banking giant from the Belarusian market. Um, so there you go. That has happened. Um, right, the construction market in Russia, says PZS01, is showing the first signs of a major F-up. The number of transactions on the secondary market in August fell by 36% year-on-year, and that's a lot. In monthly terms, the decline compared to July was 15%. So this is a fairly good canary in the coal mine as to how things are going in the economy, in the Russian economy. How is construction going? Are you building stuff? Is there a demand for new buildings because, you know, the economy is going well and people are investing and people are building stuff. They want new shops. They want new this. Or is your construction industry going down the pan? And if it's going down a pan, what's that going to do for all those supply industries? What's that going to do in terms of employment, et cetera, et cetera? Um, as he continues, in Ekaterinburg, sales on the primary market collapsed 67% after cancellation of preferential mortgages. We'll see how the construction business evolves. Um, so as someone says here, typical Ekaterinburg says, in the Ozginokidzhevsky district of Ekaterinburg in Euromash and Elmash, sales by, of apartments in new buildings fell by 67% after cancellation of preferential mortgages. Only 250 apart 51 apartments were sold. I have no idea what what the frame of reference there is. Real estate market participants offer various tools for purchasing apartments, installation, installments, trade-in, tranche mortgage, military mortgage and others. We Will they help? We all find out over time. My bet is that you are going to struggle. Uh, you know, as someone says, slowly collapsing, these things take time to gather momentum. 
I, the, I, I will go back to my claims that I've made previously that sanctions are helping and they are having an effect. And although there are many loopholes and ways around the sanctions, and you have to keep plugging those gaps, it takes such constant work from the US sec, uh, Treasury and from all these other entities. Yes, they can find ways around them, but they become more expensive. So everything just becomes more expensive in Russia because in order to buy anything through the, and get around sanctions, you, someone else is taking a cut and someone else is, you know, you're selling your widget to this person, to this person, that person, then that goes to Kyrgyzstan and that goes to there and that gets across the border and it gets into Russia. Yeah, we can buy a micro trip, but it's like 50 times more expensive because all these people are taking a cut and the original manufacturer doesn't know it's gone to Russia because it's gone... Through all, it's been laundered through all these entities, right? And that's the same for everything. So everything becomes more expensive. Then inflation is taking place, and then you've got a labor shortage, which is adds to inflation because there's not enough people. So you have to attract people with higher wages, uh, and so the every product becomes really expensive. So then you are whacking up your interest rates to try and control inflation to make sure you know people aren't spending too too much to keep inflation down. So, but then the the problem is the this is often inflation not by an overheated economy from people spending too much and having too much money. Okay, some people are are getting paid more than they were because of the labour shortage, but there's an awful lot of you know lacking elsewhere and and etc cetera, etc. Cetera. And you, and you get this situation where interest rates go up so high to try and control inflation, which means that you then can't borrow money to invest in like building projects and so on and so forth it's prohibitively high and that has an effect on the construction market i'm no economist right so this is my interpretation of what's going on i could be wrong you know this is my simplistic analysis but it's just exactly the sort of thing i'd i'd expect and and this you know you could see the russian economy really starting to struggle um now moving on Talking about the EU here, uh, well, France, sorry, not the EU. Uh, Sebastian Lecour, so fr France has had to make a new government. Snap elections are called. Rassemblement National, the far right party of Marine Le Pen, did very well, and so they, the French, have to form a new government. You've still got uh, Emmanuel Macron as president till twenty twenty seven, so that that election cycle is different, and. He has made Michel Barnier the new prime minister, taking over from Gabriel Attal, who's very strong, but Barnier should be okay. People are wondering about Sebastien Lecornu, the defence minister, because actually he's been pretty decent. I think he's held up in quite high regard, generally speaking. And this is really good news that you get some continuity there and that work he's doing with Ukraine. France have been better and better with Ukraine, although the elections got in the way and then the Olympics got in the way. So... I want to see France get back on track and I want to see Emmanuel Macron take the kind of position he was taking before the elections. Um, right, someone here, I'm just going to answer this comment uh, on one of my videos. You start out with a geopolitical outlook of the war that just isn't accurate. The Russian military isn't a threat to America. It's Russian cyber warfare and espionage that are a true threat to America. The Russian military is a, gr is a threat specifically to the Europeans. The Americans only care about that insofar as Europe represents a collective ally and insofar as Russia continues to engage in hybrid warfare with the West. If the Russians weren't picking a fight with America in the info space, they would probably only need to worry about Europe. America is callous. They'd work with the Russians against Europe if they were a reliable ally, but they aren't. So they happen to actually be doing the right thing here, helping Ukraine purely by accident. So on and so forth, talking about, you know, a cold, hard calculus. America's bigger concern is the Pacific. Actually, I will say this. It is China. Europe cares uh, less about China. It's further from their sphere of influence, but well within America's. I think it's better to see America and Europe, much as we do China and Russia, allies purely out of convenience. Europe has no loyalty to America. America has no loyalty to Europe, but it serves both our interests to cooperate because neither of us could stand up to both Russia and China without the other. Don't get swept in the, up in the media narratives they throw out there to justify the alliances and enemies. It's fickle and will change as soon as the geopolitical landscape changes. State media is purely a tool to justify geopolitical actions. Don't mistake these facetious claims of a special relationship for a genuine declaration of loyalty. It's purely a matter of justifying their political position, geopolitical position. Now, there's a lot to this I actually agree with. And I think countries generally are a lot more uh, transactional 
um, make decisions that are self-serving. So we often say this about China and India, actually, and uh, more so than Russia. So China's alliance with Russia is a marriage and convenience. And actually, they don't really care about ideology. They care more about sorting themselves out and looking after themselves. And so Russia is useful for them to forward to, yeah, to to those ends, right? Um, the argument here is that the US and Europe are only kind of allied together out of usefulness. But the, the, the thing that's missing here is that, yeah, we're allied together because we're both going towards a greater end, which is a Western hege hegemony. So you want it's hegemony being a kind of supreme power. So the, the question is, would you like a US style hegemony or do you want a Russia China style hegemony? Well, no, we want a US style hegemony. Yes, I can understand US imperialism and, and I will criticize the US and have done over many, many years. But actually, I would well prefer to take that than the alternative. And so this isn't just about um, this isn't so reductionist as I think this guy is, this or girl, woman, I don't know, Megan set, sets out. Uh, and and actually, there there is an ideology at base here, which is actually what you want the end outcome to be. So the, Europe would, would much rather the US and Europe uh, the head of that hegemony. And so it is in our interests to support the US. And the US will be looking at, yes, the US is more interested in China than Europe, but actually the EU does have a lot of worries about China and they're worried about the Belt and Road Initiative coming through Serbia and and Hungary through uh, the back door into Europe. So actually there are some really major concerns about, about China in the EU. But also, while the US probably prima facie is more concerned about China or would be more concerned about China, China is learning from Russia's actions in Ukraine. And so therefore for the, the most efficient way, like, you know, you the US doesn't want to deal with China frontally, right? In a kind of some um, conflict that happens between the US and China. It's much cheaper, much, 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 much cheaper for the US to have Ukraine win the war in Russia. Sorry, Russia, win the war against Russia. So that China look on and say, oh, we don't want to do that. We don't want to get involved there. We're not going to get involved in Taiwan or we're going to be careful about how we interact. The, the lessons learned from Ukraine are going to be keenly felt in, in China. And they are looking, Ukraine becomes a deterrent, right? And so I think there is a lot more to this reductionist approach than, I think there are elements of this that, that are somewhat correct, but my I don't think my geopolitical outlook is inaccurate at all i think i've got i think i've got a fairly good grasp of what's going on here and uh yeah that you might it might be a bit overblown this special relationship uh it, and it does depend who you've got in charge so i think trump's approach to alliances and nato is very different to biden's and biden might talk about the special relationship in a much more historical context that that is about the the culture and connections of these countries of in Europe or, or the UK for example and the US and I don't think Trump would necessarily get that so uh, I think maybe that that approach applies more to a Trumpian outlook than a traditional US out, outlook and that includes like Reagan Republicanism so I think that the two like any kind of isolation isolationist approach will have this kind of reductive um, appraisal. I think that, that you see on the show here. So uh, I think this would apply to a Trumpian view of where US, the US sits in in the geopolitical world. It, it's a kind of weird thing because I get the sense that so many MAGA Republicans would say, USA, USA, we want the USA to be the best, yet also want to isolate themselves from the rest of the world. And you can't ha you literally can't have both. You can't be like, we are the most powerful nation in the world and everyone does what we say in USA, USA. You can't do that and then go, you guys are on your own. We're going to go into this corner over here and just hang out for like 10 years, twiddling our thumbs. Uh, and we'll come out in about 10 years and see if the world has blown up or not. Like, it doesn't work. So if you want that USA, USA outlook, then you need to maintain your position at the top of the hegemonic hierarchy. And in order to do that, you need allies, you need alliances, you need NATO, you need the EU. 
and it, it's in your your yes there is this idea of like okay we're only friends with you for our own interests yeah 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 i get that but but there is an alliance of worldviews there where democracy and freedom uh, and liberty are are there and not dictatorship and human rights abuses etc cetera, etc cetera. so there are there are ideological alignments as well as geopolitical strategic ally alliances and alignments based on wanting your country to be as powerful as it can be in, in the world and so yeah i think it's just it's more nuanced than that um but yeah i don't know if it's worth me having that conversation but i've had it with you so there you go uh, Kiev Independent reports that Zelensky's victory plan includes invitation to NATO, commitment to sustained weapons supply, according to Bloomberg. So Bloomberg sources said that Ukraine's victory plan also includes a clear pathway to European Union membership. This is very important because we have heard from some people like J.D. Vance, the vice presidential pick for Trump as uh, if he becomes president. J.D. Vance is saying, I can imagine a Trump plan would be to freeze the front lines and and Ukraine would not be able to become a member of NATO or any other such alliances. And by that, he meant the EU. In other words, it's very clear that a Trumpian approach would be that Zelensky and Ukraine would not be able to join NATO and the EU. And yet part of his victory plan, part of Zelensky's victory plan that he's um, supplied to the US is this idea that they that is, that is part of their victory plan. And, and you can understand why. I mean, goodness me for ukraine to have a sustainable future they need to not be attacked again by russia how what's the best way of not being attacked why why is it why is it that latvia and poland and estonia and finland and lithuania have not been attacked by russia hmm i wonder what it is well actually you can argue, argue finland that's a, a new one for finland but they've taken that step of joining nato so that they aren't attacked but those other nations haven't been attacked because they had Article 5 protection from the NATO, their NATO membership. And the best way, really the only way to assure, to ensure that Ukraine is not attacked again by Russia is to join NATO. Um, no report says Russia will not participate in a second peace summit mentioned by Zelensky, according to the Russian Foreign Ministry spokesperson Zakharova. Yeah. She stated that Russia has no intention of joining, claiming that the process is not related to conflict resolution. A lot of people clamoring for Russia to be a part of the second peace summit. We had that peace summit the other month that was really important, brought together, well, you had, what is it, 80 odd signatories to the peace um, like agreement. And the idea was lots of people were saying, as I say, clamoring for Russia to be a part of the next one. Well, Russia themselves said, yeah, screw you guys. We, that's, that's, not, that's not what we're about. Right, moving on to some US-based uh, politics concerning Ukraine and Russia. JM, uh, JP Morgan, sorry, JP Morgan Chase, CEO Jamie Dimon, so the CEO of a massive banking corporation, has said that people should be less focused on recent US economic news and instead worry about what he described as the axis of evil that could, quote, affect the free and democratic world for the next 100 years. OK, this is spot on, right? You can worry about, oh, inflation, and it's not to say it's not a worry. And you can worry about, I don't know, interest rates and worry about how many people have got jobs at the moment in this quarter compared to, et cetera, et cetera. You can look at the US or any country that, that, that we're talking about, maybe EU country, whatever. We can look at these countries and say, right, OK, this is the most important thing. Who should we vote for that's going to improve these things? And he's saying, that's not that important. What's important is... North Korea, Iran, Russia, China, the Taliban, all these countries, UAE, Saudi Arabia, these countries getting together and getting pally, right, and forming an axis of evil that is going to affect the free and democratic world for the next 100 years. So when you've got BRICS looking at gathering momentum and, and taking on more and more countries to join it, yeah, you can laugh at BRICS at the moment, but it's about what BRICS looks like in 100 years. That's the kind of crap you've got to worry about. And that's how you need to be considering your vote when it comes to at least the geopolitical foreign um, foreign policy part of your voting decision. 
so uh, this is yeah your average joe your low information voter in the u.s at the moment isn't going to be voting on account of who's going to be more pally with king john un but he's saying oh, that's where it's at that's that's your big worry and of course you know you you can vote for immediate gain and for making you feel better about the kind of person you vote you're voting in i like trump he's really strong he's really horrible about illegal immigrants and screw those illegal Im immigrants they ruin my world every day Arr, i'm gonna vote trump in yeah brilliant okay you feel better about that he might pretend to build a wall or whatever but in reality and though it's not a concern of yours right now what does that do for where um, the us is positioned in 50 years time there are different levels of how we should vote and what we should be considering when i vote I've, i'm become this kind of big big thinker out here this is why people have said recently have you ever thought about running for for parliament you know you like your politics why not run for an mp it's like it just doesn't float my boat i'm not interested in like the everyday stuff and a local constituents it sounds horrible but like for me the big worries about the world are like climate change global instability um you know hydrocarbon manipulation and trade throughout the world and which country is doing the and you know i'm i i see things i'm more interested in the whole global approach to things rather than you know whether doris down the road has potholes in front of a house like and if i had to be dealing all my time with like oh i'm getting another you know you do these surgeries where people come in and say oh really like what have you done about like i'm waiting too long for my doctor's appointment yet yeah, that's really important i'm not saying that's not important of course but I, for me, I'd be like, oh, really? I've got to sort that out. I'm worried about whether King John Un's going to fire an intercontinental ballistic missile into the sea by Japan. Like, well, so <laughs> I don't know. I'm going off on one, but but that that's the kind of levels of voting. So you got most people are concerned with like potholes and waiting times, and as they kind of should be. But there's another level of worry that is more important because actually it has a much greater effect in the long term in in a more global sense anyway I, again i digress sorry not sorry i gave you I, I showed you the amazing interview of Mehdi hassan absolutely obliterating jill stein and holding her to account or at least she, she, she in the end she didn't and that told you everything he said can you admit that that vladimir putin is a war criminal and she would she refused to admit in in clear words that vladimir putin is a war criminal she wouldn't say it and this gained a lot of traction it went pretty viral now she's had to come out and actually make a statement so u.s presidential candidate jill steins for the left-wing green party uh, that many people are saying these are the the spoilers her cornell west um rfk jr as was were people who were spoiling for they were useful idiots essentially for trump and therefore for russia so you've got russian propagandists talking about these people as being um good for trump because they think these people attract more of the the left away from the democratic party to them so the democrats get fewer votes actually rfk jr started off that way but then started attracting more right-wing voters who were disaffected trump uh, otherwise trump voters who's saying actually rfk jr is saying such similar things to trump that i can it, i can get away with voting for rfk um as a kind of like trump's gone a bit far for me so i'll vote so that's why trump got rfk jr back on side so rfk jr then said i'm giving up and endorsing trump because actually he was, he was starting to steal more of trump's voters but Cornell West and Jill Stein will not be ste stealing Trump voters, be stealing the kind of left wing firebrand voters, but equally useful idiots for Putin. Now, not so, like there are, you know, I'm not having a go. Goodness me, I I was asked to run for the Green Party, um, in in the UK by some local people years back. So I I am I advocate green politics big time, but in Jill Stein's case, like not useful when you're considering these bigger outcomes like how will that affect who's going to be elected president and how will that affect global stability now she her not admitting that putin was a war criminal shows you the influence i think that she has from either funding or how whatever it is within her own movement that comes from russia and she didn't want to uh, to um bite the hands that feed her but then it, she showed herself to be compromised 
So now she has released a statement on September the 19th condemning Russian President Vladimir Putin as a, quote, war criminal. And what happened with Mehdi Hassan is he is he said, why don't you say, you said this about Netanyahu and you said it about Joe Biden. You have called Joe Biden a war criminal and you've called Netanyahu a war criminal. Why won't you call Vladimir Putin a war criminal? And she said, well, he's not being, uh, he's not being done for war crimes or, or she didn't say it like that. And Mehdi Hassan said, uh, yes, he has. He's literally got an arrest. She didn't even know. So I don't know how you could not know that Putin didn't, that Putin has an arrest war warrant on his head from the International Criminal Court for war crimes. He's literally like, he's an indicted war criminal, as according to the International Criminal Court. And yet she was like, I, why would I call him a war criminal if he's not? Yeah, but he is. And he has been. So I think she's had to face the facts here and then come out and give a statement saying, Oh, yeah, that guy that we were talking about before. What's that? Oh, yeah, Putin. Yeah, apparently he is a war crib lord. So sorry about that. Uh, right. Ex-Trump advisors helped to grow pro-Russia web website that spreads misinformation. This is a fascinating article, but I have spoken for way too long. Uh, it's all right. Okay. Ex-Trump advisors helped to grow uh, pro-Russia website that spreads misinformation. George Papadopoulos and others involved in intelligence, sir. Increasingly popular source of news in right-wing circles. So... I will read a lot of this because it is so interesting as to how you get end up getting a a news media source, a website, for example, that is pro-Russian or yeah, espousing pro-Russian narrative. Amid the recent crackdown on Russian influence in American media, a group of former Trump advisors and operatives have quietly helped build a pro-Russian website that frequently spreads debunked conspiracy theories about the war in Ukraine, election fraud and vaccines. Working alongside contributors for Ru Kremlin state media, the former Donald Trump policy aide, George Papadopoulos, his wife, Simona Mangiante, and others have become editorial board members for the website Intelligencer, which is increasingly becoming a source of news for those in a right-wing ecosystem. The growth of the website, which has not been reported on before comes at a time when the US is seeking a crackdown on Russian influence ahead of the 2024 election. Recently, the Justice Department charged two members of RT, formerly known as Russia Today, with violating the Foreign Agents Registration Act and money laundering for payments they allegedly made to recruit unwitting American influencers. It also placed sanctions on RT's editor-in-chief, Margarita Simonian, and nine other employees. Intelligence, sir, appears to be gaining in popularity. It recently had its best month for internet traffic, with an increase of nearly 300% during August, according to data from SimilarWeb. And its articles have been shared on social media by conspiracist Alex Jones and former Trump aide Roger Stone. According to Emma Briant, a, an associate professor of news and political communication at Monash University in Australia, the use of well-known figures to spread pro-Russian political messages represents a shift in dis disinformation tactics. Quote, since the invasion of Ukraine, Russia has increasingly been forced to rely on networks of proxies and influencers who cons whose conspiracist brand generates income and audiences through social media monetization, and some of whom Russia has now been co caught covertly subsidizing, Briant said. The website's opaque ownership structure makes it difficult to understand and its financial backing and there is no direct evidence of Kremlin funding there is no corporate entity listed anywhere on the website just a business address in Los Angeles although much of the website's content focuses on issues relating to American politics the site actually began in Australia with a little known media outlet called TNT Radio which launched in 2022 show hosts and guests frequently deny climate change discuss culture war issues in the US espouse pro russian viewpoints on the war in Ukraine and spread conspiracy theories about covid Jennifer Squires, one of the station's owners, explained in an interview that Intelligence had began as a way for TNT Radio to have a written publication to complement its radio station. To develop the new site, Squires said she turned to George Eliasson, an American journalist who lived in eastern Ukraine for more than 10 years. Eliasson, who already had a show on TNT Radio at the time, has formally appeared on RT and blamed Kiev for the war in Ukraine. OK, pause. So this is fascinating for me. I... This is so insidious, but exactly what we'd expect. It's about culture wars, narratives, things like climate change denial, COVID-19 uh, issues, anti-vaccine stuff, all that, which some of you will be going, well, what's wrong with that? I don't believe in climate change, I don't know, vaccines, blah, blah, blah. But generally speaking, these divisive issues are what is weaponized by Russia to cause division and um, chaos in the countries that they are planning to uh, screw over, like for example, the US, and then in that division, they will herald and they will amplify, and through people like Elon Musk, of course, ampl amplify one side of 
the uh, one side. In, in, in this case, it's going to be Donald Trump for the Re Republicans. Uh, but on the back of culture wars and all those things already mentioned. Now, here they have got a radio station that says, right, we're going to start a website that's going to sit alongside that. And we're going to get involved one guy who's already part of the radio station who has been living in eastern Ukraine as a pro-Russian, uh, kind of pro-DPR, LPR kind of guy who goes on Russia Today, which has already been sanctioned to spread his disinformation, etc., etc. He's going to be heavily involved in in the editorial board for um, for this intelligencer website. Uh, but Squire said she and co-owner Mike Ryan quickly grew disillusioned with the website's planned appearance and sought to disassociate themselves from it. However, Eliasson, so the American living in eastern Ukraine for 10 years, continued to develop it, involving several others who had previously appeared on his radio show. The site appears to have launched at the end of 2023, and nearly half of intelligence's board members are either former aides, surrogates of fake electors for sur surrogates or fake electors for Trump's previous two campaigns. Wow. Quote, the editorial board is filled with very accomplished people, all who are, all are or were experts at the top of the field and extremely qualified to write articles inside their fields of knowledge, Eliasson said. Perhaps the most well-known ex-Trump official is Papadopoulos, who served as a foreign policy aide to Trump in his 2016 campaign. In 2018, he pleaded guilty to lying to the FBI about his contacts with a Kremlin-linked professor who told him Russia had dirt on Hillary Clinton. Go and watch Active Measures, uh, which is an excellent documentary on this kind of stuff. Mangianti, his wife, has written several posts for the site about debunked conspiracy theories involving the Bidens in Ukraine. In January, she posted an interview with a former Ukrainian lawmaker, Andrei Durkach, who repeated false claims of bribery about the Biden family in Ukraine. In 2020, the US placed sanctions on Durkach, calling him an active Russian agent. Durkach, who now is running for political office in Russia, previously met with Rudy Giuliani and purported to offer evidence of corruption against the Bidens. Quote, Intelligencer appears to be one of several Russia-friendly operations targeting the upcoming US elections, leveraging network of far-right figures and disinformation tactics, Olga Lautman, a senior fellow at the Centre for European Policy Analysis, said. Mangiente, along with fellow board member Igor Lopatonok, um, appears to have parlayed this work into a new documentary about the Hunter Biden laptop saga called Hunter's Laptop Requiem for Ukraine. According to social media posts, the documentary premiered on the 5th of September at the Trump International Hotel in Chicago. Just like if you can't draw lines between all these dots here, if you can't join the dots here and understand that the whole Trump ecosystem is heavily involved in anti-Ukraine activities, then I can't help you because the evidence is there. Go and look at active measures. Go and look at everything he said. Go and look at my video on Trump and his history with Ukraine. Go and look at all the data. Go and look at this and how why a film that is that is heavily pro-Russian, but you know, getting doing that through the Hunter Biden laptop thing is being um, premiered at the Trump International Hotel in Chicago. Eliasson wrote the script, which is filmed by Lepotonok, uh, who has frequently collaborated with Oliver Stone, who's another pro-Russian, Oliver Stone, anti-Ukraine, used to be a great filmmaker, has now just lost the plot entirely, um, on prior anti-Ukrainian documentaries and fawning films of dictators. So Oliver Stone seems to love dictators these days. Uh, Mr. Lepotonok wanted fresh eyes on an, uh, from an investigative journalist and a different perspective for the story, Eliasson said. Through the combined interviews, we are able to plumb deeper and raise questions that had not been asked before. Eliasson also said that the address listed on intelligence website was provided by Lepotonok. Lepotonok did not respond for, respond for comments uh, requests for comments. However, he now appears to have implemented part of his business in Moscow. According to Russian corporate records, Lepotonok and his wife, Vera Tomilova, also an intelligence board member, hmm, uh, that's an interesting name there, uh, registered a Global 3 Pictures LLC in Moscow in February. According to inv invitations for the Hunter Biden documentary premiere, the event was hosted by Christian Orthodox Coalition, an organisation which claims to educate Orthodox Christians on social and cultural issues. Oh, the circle is all being completed here. It all comes back and it's a cultural wars. How can we get you, uh, are we going to, uh, appeal to you on the fact that the gays are awful and this and that and uh, war on Christmas and we'll get you and then it, it will then through like this this 
association you will then be fed disinformation about russia and aren't russia a wonderful country because they're against all this moral degeneration etc etc and then you become anti-ukraine and then you know and we'll do this and then there'll be yeah anti-climate change ideology and all etc etc and it's all part of the same ecosystem it just absolutely blows me away this um but yeah uh so uh, four of the organisations, so the Orthodox Christian Coalition board members, are also board members for Intelligence, including Papadopoulos, Mangiante, and Opotonok. The fourth board member is Olga Ravasi, who was formerly the chairwoman for Ser of Serbs for Trump in 2020 uh, and currently runs a Serbian American Voters Alliance Political Action Committee. In March, Intelligence are posted about a Serbs for Trump kickoff event in Wisconsin with the state's Republican Senator Ron Johnson, uh, who's massively anti Ukrainian, and former. A Trump acting director of national intelligence, Rick Grenell. Oh, mm. uh. um, three other editorial board members also have close connections to the Trump campaigns. Leah Hoops and Greg Strenstrom, both from Pennsylvania, have written a book falsely alleging the 2020 election was stolen. Both of them have been litigants in court cases challenging the results of the election in Pennsylvania. And Hoops was one of Pennsylvania's fake electors who falsely signed paperwork saying that Trump had won the election. And then we've got Tyler Nixon, Roger Stone's personal attorney, who serves on the board, the host of his own show on TNT Radio. The former Radio Sputnik journalist Lee Stranahan is also involved. So you've got Sputnik, who is an actual Russian di uh, disinformation uh, propagandist network that's now been sanctioned. You've got all these people all in the ecosystem of the Trump campaign and all campaigning for Trump, but are actually just Russian... Um, surrogates and proxies and it's just incredible and so on and so on you go and read more it's just you can read go and read to the end but you get the you get the point here and you wonder why i am deeply anti-ukraine uh, anti sorry anti-trump there are many reasons i am but one of the prevailing ones in the context of my um ukraine war videos is that he is not the best person for ukraine in any way, shape or form, you look at all of the connections, you look at how fundamentally compromised not just he is, not just his organisations are, but all the organisations around him, all the campaigns around him. And this is just one, just using the example of one website, the Intelligencer, which spreads Russian propaganda. And you find out who sits on the board member on the board and how connected to Russia they truly are. And then you see the connections to all these sanctioned Russian propagandist organizations like Sputnik and, and the crossover and the people who are tainted by you know, RT and Sputnik. And, and they're all existing in this ecosystem. It is dangerous. It's freaking dangerous. And it, people don't realize this. And they should realise this. And it just frustrates the head out of me. Luckily, there are some Republicans who seem to know what's going on. And we have this. I think this was this was from some guy some time ago. But it's worth remembering that Mitch McConnell actually has a better grasp of what's going on. And I don't In like the Mitch time McConnell. of the delay. Russia's military land forces have grown back to where they were before the invasion. The army. So this is talking about the seven month delay. So this is back when this was just going on. He's 15 percent larger and they've reinforced the 20 percent of Ukrainian territory that they hold. These are all the words of the Supreme Allied Commander himself. Do you feel your party is responsible for those setbacks? Uh, many of them, yeah. We, we took too long. Uh, this issue was like a family uh, reunion, if you will, with a lot of different points of view being expressed around the table. All the Democrats were for Ukraine. There's no question that the debate was in our family, on our side, and there was a lot of skepticism for a long time. But all the Democrats were on board, they were all pro Ukraine. So, and, and the problems were with the Republicans. So, interesting. Now, YouTube is now being completely blocked in the Russia. So talking about disinformation, what we do about that and how we how we sanction disinformation. YouTube has been completely blocked in the Russian Federation. So this is Russia sanctioning YouTube that allows Russians to find out about about truth. Uh, so this is from a Russian point of view. Deputy Speaker of the State Duma said, according to him, this will happen after domestic platforms such as RuTube and VK Video are set up to... Uh, offer alternative content monetization uh, systems. Now, on the other hand, TikTok has deleted accounts that belong to RT and Sputnik. Uh, 
that's incredibly important. So it's deleted accounts of propaganda Sputnik International, Sputnik Serbia, Sputnik Afrique, Sputnik Africa, Sputnik Brazil, Sputnik Mundo, and Sputnik Indonesia. This came amid US accusations that the propagandists interfered in the elections. RT complained. Meta had previously deleted all of RT's Instagram and Facebook accounts without the ability to restore them or appeal the decision. Um, fascinating stuff there. A bit of fight back there, there from sort of sanctioning. Meanwhile, Russian Foreign Ministry has said, uh, as a result of all these things, that um, America's just like the Third Reich. And of course, that's in incredible since uh, Russia has banned all independent media and most social media sites, uh, and then they cry Nazis and that the uh, Americans are the Third Reich for banning RT. Just absolutely unbelievable um, ridiculousness there. Anyway, that's enough from me. Uh, let me know what you think. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Take care. Just be cool. But if you do disagree, do it nicely um, and speak to you soon.